Good morning. Good morning. Good to see all of you here. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, the second Sunday of Advent. I want to welcome the folks online also. Thank you for joining us, folks. Glad you're here. We praise God for you. And um, as we get started here, just going to start off with a few announcements. 
Um, our blood drive is very successful. You can see the details there in the bulletin. I know many of you came and gave. Thank you for that. Um, we collected 23, or the Red Cross collected 23 life-saving pints of blood. So that was even more, one more than what they had hoped for. So thank you, everyone, who gave. I want to let you know about a few service opportunities. Um, the food shelf would be one in particular where uh, we've had some turnover because of folks moving away about on it, you know. We've had some folks move to Texas and folks move to Canada, some of our core team there, and they could really use some help. So uh, if you might uh, feel moved or know someone who might feel moved to be um, a help to the food shelf, someone who's able-bodied, right, someone who can pick up boxes and whatnot, um, and also maybe someone who's computer savvy. We need someone who can help with some tech that we're introducing um, to the food shelf ministry. And so please consider that. If you're interested, speak to me, or you can email the address there, which will go to our food shelf leadership. Or you can speak to Sue Schreier in the back. Sue's one of our leaders over at the food shelf. So put your hand up. There she is. If you're interested in helping. Now, thank you. Also, um, our church calendars are um, pretty much almost ready. If you haven't gotten one, um, I invite you to, to consider picking one up um, or at least signing up. The sign-up sheet's in the back there. Our first page is full, so you have to flip over to the second page. If you look at it, say, no, I'm going to put my name down. There's more of us sheets there. So, um, so take, take a moment and ponder that. The proceeds from our calendar uh, ministry or program goes into, um, into our uh, outreach programs. And so it is a blessing to our church. We ask $15 for each of those. And some people just like to give, and so if you don't really want a calendar, I get that. You can always just give, and it'll go into our outreach ministries. If you want to write a check, make sure you put calendar on there. Um, so thank you. And then the pageant, right? This is a really big um, event coming up on uh, December 19th at 6.30. So you can read the, more of the details there in the bulletin um, about the make sure you dress appropriately and bring cookies if you want to uh, contribute you can bring some cookies and uh, yeah so please come out this year it's going to be um, closer to our normal way of doing it than it was last year last year we kind of had this uh, semi kind of um, not really virtual experience but we kind of drive through experience which was really neat and well received um, this year we're going to walk around the green together as a group will be outdoors and then we'll remain outdoors for the, um, the fellowship time afterwards. We're going to gather by the bonfire and have cookies and cocoa and stuff outside. So anyway, invite you to participate. And then once again, I'd just like to thank Felicia. Um, Felicia Post for all her efforts with Operation Christmas Child. And Felicia does a lot here Sunday mornings with the uh, audio video stuff. So, uh, so thank you, Felicia, for all you've done for OCC and for, uh, for the audio video. We praise God for you. And that's all I've got this morning, so we'll bring in the light now. Take a moment and stand and say hello to your neighbors if you feel so moved. And then remain standing going out of the hallway. Here, um, 
uh, the scriptures call us into this moment, into this act of worship. And uh, we're going to hear it this morning through Psalm 95, verses 1 through 4. And I'm going to read this, just me, and then we'll slide into a responsive reading out of Luke chapter 1, a passage that no doubt many of you will be very familiar with. So this is just me here calling us, and the scriptures calling us to worship here. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountain mountains are his also. Praise God. Now we'll slide into a responsive scripture reading out of Luke chapter 1. Your parts are going to be in the bowl. It will be up here on the screen. <clears throat> in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was <clears throat> And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his son David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Let's pray to God, and to God together as we start our service. Oh Lord, we take joy in this news. We take joy in the news that there is one who was coming and has come and will come again. One who will reign on the throne of the kingdom of God forever and ever. And his name is Jesus. We rejoice in that news this morning. We pray, God, that that news, again, would not just be out there, somewhere out there in some land far away for us, but it would be news that we would receive this morning as um, right, as having to do with us and right here present with us in this moment. News given to us, not to someone way out there. God, I pray this news would Touch our hearts this morning that we would be really and truly changed and molded more and more into your likeness as we ponder the significance of these things together, God. Fill our mouths now as we move into worship with songs of praise and of deliverance. We love you. We thank you. Be exalted in this time, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's worship together.
Oh Lord Jesus, you are our King. Uh, you are the one that has come uh, to rule and reign and that is ruling and reigning. God, we so desire that you would rule and reign over our hearts right now. That our ways would be your ways. Our desires, your own desires. Or that we would be uh, subjects who love you and worship you with our whole lives. Thank you for not being a king that divides or destroys. You are a king that came that we might have life and that more abundantly. And that in all things you are working for our good. We praise you and thank you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, General Carroll. <clears throat> You'll notice this morning we are thinking about kingship. This is a theme in our call to worship and in the passages we've read in our singing. Um, and we'll hear more of this as we go along in the, in the service. And thinking about the fact that uh, Jesus is the kind of kind of king and ruler that brings peace. Not one that destroys or divides, but one that brings peace. So I want to invite now Kevin and Sherry Blakeman forwards to uh, share the Advent reading. And um, it's the second Sunday of Advent, and they will be lighting the candle of peace. and a deliverer to save us from the fear of judgment and death. The prophet Isaiah foretold that one day a virgin would give birth to a child who would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Israel looked forward to the day when this Prince of Peace would come. Today we celebrate the coming of this peace in the person of Jesus. He tells us, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Today we light the candle of peace to proclaim the coming of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Let's go before the Lord now in prayer together, shall we? <clears throat> Lord, as we come to you in prayer now, as we think about peace, Lord, we know it is in prayer, partly, that we find this peace that you offer and give. This peace right now is one that has um, many um, ramifications on our, our lives, but will one day be felt fully and completely at your second coming. We look forward to that day, Prince of Peace, Lord Jesus, when you come again. We pray, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Oh, how we long for you to come and to fully and completely usher in the everlasting era of peace. We long for that. But now you offer us this peace in our lives and in our hearts. Um, but you tell us we must come to you. We must come regularly in prayer. We must lift our burdens to you with thanksgiving. And you will guard our hearts and our minds with your peace, which surpasses all understanding. So we come now and we enter into the very presence of God, into that holy of holies, which we have access to in the person of Jesus. 
we come to you, our Father, and we lift our burdens to you. We thank you that we have access to you, that you are a king that's not in a distant land, uh, ruling and reigning over your subjects very uh, indirectly or at arm's length, that we have access. We can come right into your very throne room. We have the kind of access that only children have, the kind of access where we can come in the middle of the night and shake you and, and wake you up, so to speak. Of course, we know we don't, you don't slumber, Lord. We can come to you in the night and shake you and say, I need you, Abba. I need you right now. We have that kind of access, the kind of access that only children have. And we are, through faith in Jesus Christ, your children. We praise you for that this morning, for that access. And we want to avail ourselves fully of it this morning. And Lord, we know as we think about who you are, as we think about what you've done for us, that you came and, and gave your life, gave your son, that we might have this access, that we might uh, be redeemed, and that we might have all the gifts and blessings that are ours in Christ Jesus, that we realize we are not so generous. We realize we so often are, are not that way, that we fall so short. Maybe we um, struggle with uh, the thing with all that you are, we struggle with being compassionate, we struggle with being truthful, we struggle with being um, God, people of integrity. And Lord, you are all of those things. And so, Lord, we want to take a moment as we enter in and as we are confronted once again with who you are to pause and remember who we are and to confess our sins before you. So, uh, so I invite you this morning in your seats or at home, wherever you are, to silently there take a moment and and acknowledge who you are and your failures from this past week and shortcomings and sins before the Lord. not have done. We recognize that. And we plead your mercy. We plead. Be merciful. Be kind to us as you've promised. Not because of who we are or anything we've done. We're not lifting up our goodness and saying because we are so good or we did that thing last week. God have mercy. No. We are saying have mercy because of what Jesus did because of Him, because of His love, His sacrifice, His gift to us in coming and dying. Have mercy. And because of who He is right now, that that sacrifice is not something that just happened 2,000 years ago and no bearing on today. It pleads for us. His blood, His sacrifice right now pleads for us. And he does before the very throne of grace, right now interceding for us. So we say, because of him, have mercy on us. Thank you that you do promise that if we come and confess our sins, you will be faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us. What a promise. No matter what we've done this week, there's no asterisk or footnote on that promise only certain sins qualify, does not apply to this, does not apply to that, all that fine print that you see on a coupon. We bring the complete 100% payment complete in full coupon with no asterisk or footnote. And his name is Jesus. We thank you for him. We praise you. So many things to be thankful for in addition to the Lord Jesus, the fact that we have this place together, the fact that we can still in freedom proclaim this news, the fact that your love has been shed abroad in our hearts and we really love people and we are loved by others in this faith community. 
We thank you for those things. Thank you for the joy and fellowship we'll share following the service, Lord willing, at our pop up. Thank you for the food shelf and all its ministries. Thank you for so many people here that serve and give, that put together the communion table, for people that come in and fold bulletins, people that open the doors and set up flags and sweep floors and put out tablecloths that wash dishes and paint kitchen cabinets. So many things, Lord, to be thankful for. And the strength to do all of those. We bless you. Lord, we thank you this morning for the life of Donna Howe. We miss her, God. We know her precious husband, Ernie, does too. And all her family. We want to lift them to you now and pray, God, that you would be close to them in this hour. Comfort them and strengthen them. Lord, we love them. Bless that family. Walk with them in this hour of loss and grief. But we rejoice, Lord, and take hope knowing that Donna was a woman with a deep faith, a woman who trusted you. And we know that she is at peace right now with you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. God, we pray um, as we think about those things that we're all walking through, so many of us facing diagnoses or or perhaps loss um, or some financial hardship, so many things we are facing right now in our lives, broken relationships, um, God, uncertainty about our future, whatever it might be. We want to take a moment and lift those burdens to you because you tell us to, not because we just had no one else to go to. Lord, we know that ultimately you are our friend and you ask us and invite us into, um, or you, you say that you want us to invite you into these struggles. So we do that now, oh Lord. We want to take a moment, wherever you are, at home, in your seat, pause, lift your burdens to God silently there in your seat. What a joy that we can bring our burdens to the Lord in prayer. And He hears us. We know we are heard. We come in faith. Faith in the Lord Jesus. Not demanding answers, but humbly requesting. We pray you will move in our lives that your will would be done. All of these things we ask and pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> now to transition into... Hearing the Lord speak to us through his word, I'm just going to pause briefly and pray once more, asking God to bless the reading and the preaching of the word. Lord, we do lift up this time now. Pray our hearts would transition now and would be in a posture of hearing and a posture of receiving, a posture of, of, of being students and pupils. All of our life, we will come and sit at your feet and we will learn from the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Speak to us this day, O King. We bow at your feet. May our hearts bow as well. May we receive what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite Tim Miller to come forward and be for us this morning. Scripture today is from Matthew 
beginning in chapter 22, 41 through 46. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David, in the Spirit, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word. Nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. This is the word of the Lord for us today. And I don't see that. Yeah, that's okay. Yep. Right. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Yep. Grass withers and the flower fades. The word of our God will stand forever. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, a few weeks ago, we were reading a Bible lesson as a family, and I, I posted this on Facebook. I think some of you may have saw it. And the lesson talked about how Jesus was our deliverer. And my youngest daughter suddenly interjected and asked, Daddy, Jesus was a pizza delivery guy? <laughs> <clears throat> I didn't even know what she meant at first. I was like, where is that coming from? Then it hit me. Oh, she heard the word deliverer and just immediately connected it to pizza delivery. Then we had a good chuckle again. <laughs> I was a little late to coming to that part. <laughs> but kids ask the best questions sometimes, don't they? Sometimes they see things in a way that us adults just completely miss or overlook. Sometimes their questions really get you thinking and are sometimes often even more profound than we initially see or think. We get to thinking about it and we say, wow, that was actually really deep, even though on the surface it might sound really simple. Well, the question here in our passage before us today that Jesus asked the Pharisees would have sounded to them like a childish question. It was so obvious and so simple to them in their time and place. The Pharisees were some of the most educated people in the land, at least in regards to the scriptures, the Old Testament and, and Jewish theology. They were very educated. So the question in verse 42, what do you think about the Christ, whose son is he, would have been like asking someone with a PhD to answer a question that any average kindergartner could handle. Everyone in that time and place would have known the answer to this question. The Christ, the Messiah, the word Christos, by the way, or Christ, was the New Testament word for the Old Testament word uh, Mashiach, or Messiah. But this question, they knew that the Messiah, the Christ, would come from the line of David. Everyone knew this. He was David's son. Jesus' question would have been so simple, again, that a child could have, would have been able to answer it very quickly at that time. They knew this David. When people thought of David, they would have thought of what? A great king. Again, we're focusing on thinking about kings this morning. This David was the mightiest and the greatest king of Israel. It was this David who ushered in the high point of the nation's history. This David was the one who defeated Goliath. This David wrote most of the hymn book for God's people, what we know today of as the Psalms, the Psalter. He's the one who wrote, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. These are words that we've probably heard hundreds of times, many of us in our lifetime. It was this David that the Bible calls a man after God's own heart. And this same David was promised by God that his throne would be established forever. That his kingdom would be made sure to last forever. You can read more about that in 2 Samuel chapter 7 if you're interested. It was firmly believed in that time and place that the Christ, the Messiah, would be a descendant from David. Jesus' question, again, would have been so simple for these learned men. 
would have been like asking an accomplished Ameri American historian who George Washington was. They would have looked at you like, okay, this is too easy, right? This is simple. But then you'll notice in our passage, he asks another question. And this is where the childlike question that he asked previously uh, is revealed to actually be much more. In verses 43 to 45, he shows them that there is a lot they actually don't know about this Christ that was to come from the line of David. This Messiah was going to be not only a descendant from David, that's what they mean by son here, a descendant in the line of to come later on, but somehow he would also be David's Adonai, David's Lord. How could that be? How could that be? So the child's question suddenly is revealed to be a very profound, deep question. And they don't have it. Well, today we're going to take a look a bit deeper at what it means that Jesus was the son of David. What is the significance of this fact? And does it mean anything for you and me today? Last week we pondered together the significance of of the fact that Jesus was the son of Joseph and Mary. If you'll remember, some of you were here for that. It's okay if you weren't. But Joseph and Mary, right? The carpenter and the young teenage girl. We saw how this revealed some things that were unexpected and shocking. Remember we talked about that last week. These surprises, these shocking things. Well, this morning I think we're going to make some other interesting discoveries together and find... Uh, some of the implications about the son of David. So, so last week we focused on Jesus, son of Joseph, son of Mary. Today we're going to look at Jesus, son of David. So here's the big idea I want to try and get across today. Because Jesus is the son of David, yet also the son of Joseph and Mary, which we talked about last week, we must realize he is a different kind of king. So this son of David, David was the king. His son was thought to be, expected to be, a great kingly figure. But we're going to see, Jesus is a different kind of king. Okay? Point number one, unlike earthly kings, and we're thinking about kings, this is hard for us in America to understand, right? If we don't have a king, I'm thinking more of like just people with power and influence, right? Influential, powerful people. Unlike earthly kings, people with power and influence, we must realize that King Jesus is approachable. He is approachable. That's the first point. Point number one. According to a celebrity news outlet online, so I was doing a little research about people with power and influence this week, and uh, these things won't surprise you when I share some of this, probably. But according to a celebrity news outlet, there's these outlets that like to focus on, you know, the people in our culture that are well-known and respected and in places of power and influence. Uh, there was a very famous actress and singer, I'm not going to name them because I don't want to disparage them, um, a very famous actress and singer uh, snubbed a United Airlines flight attendant when she was asked if she wanted a drink in first class. According to the attendant, she turned her head away and told her personal assistant Please tell him I'd like a Diet Coke and a lime. So the attendants are right there, and she won't look at him and answer him. She turns to her assistant and tells her to tell him what she wants to have. She wouldn't even look at, look at me, the attendant says. It was so sad because she seemed so sweet in her movies. Another celebrity I was reading about grew angry with a fan. After she greeted him by poking him on the shoulder, I guess come up to him at an event, poked him on the shoulder and said, hey, the actor was visibly irritated and put his finger in her face, turned around and pointed at her in her face and said, don't you ever touch me, understand? Now again, we don't know what these people were going through, right? A rough day, whatever. But there are all kinds of examples like this of our earthly leaders, right? People of power and influence doing things like this. Yet with Jesus, these are relatively small things, right? I could mention much bigger things, but I'm trying to convey a point here about approachability. Yet Jesus 
With him, we find something so very different, do we not? We find he is approachable, touchable, and caring. Even though people knew he was the much-awaited son of David, they felt as though they could come right up to him, touch him, say hey to him, talk to him. For example, in Matthew 9, 27 and 31, I'm going to give you a few examples of these. Feel free to flip there if you want. Matthew 9, 27 to 31. Uh, I'm going to read it here. As Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this, to heal them? They said to him, Yes, Lord. And then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about it. But they went away and spread his fame through all of that district. But there's that title, Father, Son of David, have mercy. They call him the Son of David. He gets no rebuke for it, implying, yes, that's right. I am this figure that is coming. And then he goes and heals them and asks for no honor in return. Is that not amazing? No honor. I am that Son of David. They don't spread a word about me. Jesus was approachable and generous and humble. He did not use the title Son of Man or Son of David to draw fame or seek honor. It was not a way to get more likes or views on his page, right? He wasn't making a plug for his page. Check me out on YouTube, man. Yeah. Isn't it amazing to think that Jesus never claimed to be the Son of David? He never claimed that for himself, actually. The scriptures over and over again tell us that he is that long-awaited one, that descendant of David, that kingly figure that was coming, but he never claimed it for himself. The passage we read at the start of the service out of Luke chapter 1 tells us he was a descendant in the line of David, as many other places do tell us. Another example, take Matthew 12, 22 and 23. Feel free to flip there if you want. Matthew 12, 22 and 23. Then a demon-oppressed man, who was blind and mute, was brought to him, and he healed him, so that the man spoke and saw. And all of the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? There it is again. People are, light bulbs are going off. People are connecting dots. Again, he does not correct them for using the title. And once again, Jesus is readily approached and helps someone in need. He doesn't turn around and say, don't you ever ask me to heal you, right? Or to touch, don't touch me. He happily helps, does he not? One more example of this, Matthew 20. Matthew is, really focuses on this. Actually, the phrase Son of David is found more in Matthew than any other place in the New Testament. Matthew 20, verses 29 to 32. And as they left Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. There it is again. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. But they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, listen to the contrast here to those other examples. What do you want me to do for you? Is that not amazing that he would stop? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus, in pity, touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. What are we to make of this? One thing we can clearly say from these examples, Jesus was approachable, right? He was accessible, approachable. People had no fear of just going right up to him and speaking to him and asking humbly for help. Lord, help me. What does this mean for us? I think there's obvious implications for us right today. We can be just like these people, right? We can be like them. Just go to Jesus. Go 
go up to him. Go to the son of David, the king of kings. He will not reject you. Put his finger in your face and say, don't ever touch me. You will never get that from the Lord Jesus. He's not going to turn to one of his assistants and speak to you through them. Hey, Peter, come here. Will you tell this person? No. He will look at you directly and speak to you as his friend. As your friend. Yet even though he is a king, he can relate to you. And perhaps this is, goes along with accessibility, right? And approachability. He can relate to you. Remember, he was born on the floor of a cattle stall, was a carpenter in a broken home with a lot of kids. He's approachable, comfortable with your mess. Just go to him. Don't let your fears of being rejected or turned away keep you from him. He will not cast you out or reject you. Go, just like these men and women, the stories we've read, and just cry out, have mercy on me, son of David. And he will hear you. That's point number one. Point number two, unlike earthly kings, we must also realize that King Jesus is a suffering king. So we've seen, unlike earthly uh, leaders, he's approachable, he's accessible. Now we're going to see that he's also a suffering king. A suffering king. Remember last time we talked about the impressions that people had of the Messiah. Some of you were here last week, if you remember. Again, it's okay if you, you weren't. But these impressions that people had of the Messiah in that time and place, they imagined that he was going to be a strong, military, powerful, conquering figure. Remember we talked about that. He was going to run the Romans out of town and purify and clean up Israel, if you remember that. When we think of a figure like that, when you think of someone who's going to do those things, we do not imagine them as suffering, do we? As someone who suffers or hurts. No. We think of them as bulletproof, right? Strong, capable. Have you ever seen a picture of a famous athlete 20 years later after their glory days? You ever seen a picture like that? Oftentimes they put on some weight Maybe their hair is gray and falling out, or perhaps even in some cases they're dealing with some illness or disability. It reminds us, does it not, that our heroes, those people who can do great things, are often very fragile, also, just like us. But we still don't remember them that way, do we? When we think of our favorite athlete or person out there, oftentimes we don't think of them in that fragile state. We think of them in sort of their prime and their... Glory days, so to speak. These unmatched, superhuman types of people. So even though the Old Testament scriptures foretold that the Messiah was not only the son of David, the king, they also foretold that he would be one who would suffer immensely. But sadly, by the time Jesus was on the scene, the emphasis had almost completely morphed into this king-like military type figure leader. They had almost totally forgotten that the scriptures say the Messiah, the son of David, would suffer. They had forgotten these parts. And the emphasis was all on the king, the mighty strong one who's going to come and deliver us. Isaiah 53 is one such passage that over the years was passed over and neglected. And this is what it says of the Messiah, the coming Son of David. I'm just going to read a few verses out of Isaiah 53. I'm going to start at verse 4 and go down just a few. Surely he, in speaking of this coming figure, has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We have seen him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. There's that word, peace again. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. And he was afflicted. And yet opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. 
By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. He goes on. He goes on to describe this coming figure. No violence. Man of peace. He has suffered immensely. That doesn't sound like a king, does it? When we think about it. I don't think so. We must realize that Jesus, the son of David, if he is this figure, this coming one, this king, this son of David, that he certainly was a different kind of king, right? Than maybe what we expected. When we think of kings or people of great power and influence, we usually think of people with resources, people who are well-connected, with deep pockets, who have few problems, maybe. Of course, I remember the song growing up, um, Puff Daddy, No Money, No Problems. So, to some degree, people of influence have more problems. But you get what I'm saying, right? They don't have, we view them in this sort of untouchable category, like, hey, they just got everything going for them, it's okay. They're healthy. They've got personal trainers and chefs and big houses and nice cars and travel the world doing whatever they want. This is the image we have of leaders, kings. But that is not the king we are given in the scriptures. This son of David understands suffering and pain. He understands the plight of the lowly, the poor, the outcasts, the ones on the fringes. And he doesn't just understand intellectually. He understands existentially. He himself has suffered. He has been poor. The scriptures say of Jesus, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. I love that passage. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. This is indeed a different kind of king. This king did not stay in the palace, but came out into the streets where you and I live, and there he suffered with us and for us. And he didn't do that so that you could just bottle up all of your pain inside of yourself. He did that so that you could unload it on him. Unload it. This king is not going to give you a burden and increase your labors in building his palaces and planting his vineyards. This king serves you and suffers for you. He gives of himself to relieve your burdens. So not only is he approachable, but he is available and willing to have you cast your cares upon him. This is a suffering king. And that's point number two. Point number three I'd like to make this morning is that unlike earthly kings, we must realize that King Jesus is a king who comes in peace. Who comes in peace. And this ties in with some of the themes this morning, the candle of peace. A really interesting passage that gives us a glimpse into these things. Of course, we've just heard one out of Isaiah 53, where it talks about, right, by his wounds were healed, and, and how he did no violence, right, that this man was a man of peace. Um, another interesting passage is Matthew 21. Matthew 21. So we're bouncing around a little bit this morning. That chapter begins with the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem for the last week of his earthly life. He comes into the city, into Jerusalem, and there are these great crowds, and they are shouting as he comes in. Verses 8 and 9 tell us um, some information about what was happening. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road, treating him like a king, right? This is a kingly figure. We are honoring him as he comes into the city. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. There it is again. Son of David. Hosanna. Hosanna means save us. Save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Here they are once again, attributing to Jesus this messianic title, this title that was given only to this coming Messiah, Son of David. 
And they are shouting it out. And yet, what is he writing on? This is one of the characters in this story that are often forgotten. It's often forgotten, right? Is he on a white horse of battle? Is he coming on a great chariot? No. He's riding on a young, never before ridden, probably being weaned, donkey. A donkey was a beast of burden, a working animal, an animal of service, of suffering. As such, many scholars say that donkeys were a symbol of peace, a symbol of peace. Once again, we are reminded that this King Jesus is different. This Son of David is perhaps not what we expected. He comes in peace. He comes as the Son of David, not the military warrior, but as one bringing peace. And like so many of our leaders today who are only concerned with money and power and reputation, this king comes in peace. In fact, so committed is this king to peace that he will give himself up to accomplish it. We didn't have to negotiate or manipulate or persuade or bargain to get this king to act on our behalf. There was no bartering or trade agreement in the deal where we give something and he gives something in order to make peace. No treaty was signed. No swords clashed or wars were waged. Jesus the King, the Son of David, the promised Messiah and Deliverer, offered up himself of his own accord to make peace. To have peace with God, all you must do is receive it. Receive it. Receive God's peace by merely accepting this precious gift. When you accept that God has loved you in this way by sending Christ to die, it will change you. Not only will you have peace with God, but you have inward peace as well. And that's point number three. This king brings peace. He brings peace. Comes in peace and brings it. Point number four. Unlike earthly kings, we must realize that King Jesus is worthy of worship. Worthy of worship. That's our last point. When you realize all these things, that the Son of David is approachable, that the Son of David suffers with you and for you, that he came in peace to make peace between you and God, offering up his own life, it will move you to worship him. You will worship. And your worship will be accepted because he is worthy of it. Worthy of this worship. No earthly leader or king can say that, can they? No. Only Jesus is worthy of our worship. And going back to where we started at the beginning of the sermon, Jesus asks the religious scholars a simple question that any child in that day could have easily answered. But then he turns and reveals again that the question is actually much deeper. I want to walk you through this very quickly. Let's go again to that passage. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? Jesus asks. Right? Very simple question. And they said to him, Son of David. Probably with an eye bill, right? Son of David, man. What do you think? He said to them, How is it then that David in the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. The quote in verse 44 comes out of Psalm 110. And every orthodox, that means uh, sort of right-believing, um, Jewish scholar at the time, those that held to the traditional Jewish views and scriptures, they would have interpreted this passage to refer to the Messiah, to that coming person. They saw the phrase, sit at my right hand, as a reference to a position of honor. And that position could only be held, in their view, by the Messiah himself. 
So this Lord that would have somehow come from David in his line, a descendant later on, was also David's Lord, despite being his son. The only possible way that these both could be true is that this one, the Messiah, would actually be God himself in the flesh. This son of David, this king, the approachable one, the suffering one, the one who comes in peace, is also God. And all of these things culminate in what? In worship. Worship. We could worship if we couldn't worship, sorry, if we could not approach God. Right? We couldn't worship if we could not have peace with God, if we did not have peace, and we would not have peace if God had not suffered with us and for us. See how all these things we've talked about go together. Approachability, accessibility, peace, suffering, all lead to what? Worship. Worship. All of these things that the Son of David is for us make worship possible. There is no greater way to appreciate all that Jesus is for us than to fall at his feet and worship him. We're going to do that now by turning to the communion table and then closing with a song. So let's transition to the table of the Lord now. So we think about all that this Son of David was and is and will be for us. <clears throat> online, I invite you to grab your elements if you have them, and to participate with us if you are able to do that. So isn't it amazing, as we come to this table, one of the things we are remembering, again, is that this king is unlike other kings, right? That this son of David, this coming one, this deliverer, this Messiah, is different. What king would invite commoners, peasants, poor people, regular people like us, to his table. We come to the table of the king. A meal prepared by himself, not by a servant, by him. Prepared by him for us. And that meal, interestingly enough, is of himself. He gives of himself in this table. We partake of his very body and of his flesh. There's a mystery there, certainly. But as we partake, we are expressing our faith in Him, our love for Him, our worship for Him. And so I invite you to come as we think about these things together. Let's pray before we, before we partake here in just a moment. Oh Lord, we thank You for these wonderful truths that You are a King and all that comes with that. You are powerful. You are sovereign. You do reign. You are King of Kings. Lord of Lords, you are over all. You have absolute authority. Yet you use that authority and that power not to lord it over us, not to um, control the minutia of our life, not to dictate everything about us or to get something out of us, but to serve us, to love us, to sacrifice for us, that we might have more of you. And we do have more of you. We have all of you in what you've done for us. So as we come to, these, to this table, would these things be fresh in our minds and in our hearts? I pray, O oh Lord God, that you would bless this time, that these elements would be to us, the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus, that we would be strengthened and nourished in our faith and find fresh power and fresh fire in our lives to go and serve you out there, not just in these four walls, but to be your people wherever we are. Bless these elements. Bless each as they come and partake in just a moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul says, for I was 
received from the Lord, what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and he broke it, and he gave thanks, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the remission of your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Whenever we partake of this bread and this cup, we proclaim his death until he comes again. We look forward to that day. Now I'd like to invite Carol Forbes and both of you as well to serve you. You can sing for us. And Carol's going to be helping me distribute the elements. We do have a gluten-free option as well for those that need it. Oh, 
sharing another song now together. So, you want to say anything? Please stand. Let's rise and sing together. There's a, there's a reference in this song that for some of you it would help to have an explanation. It refers to, uh, is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? Uh, we don't do much scrolling these, well, yes, we do. <laughs> but not in that sense. A scroll, in this case, would be uh, an official document sealed with the, uh, the signature in, in wax of the person who, 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 uh, who wrote it, which in this case is, is God on his throne. And, the, and the, the scroll contains the unfolding of history and God's plan for the completion of history. But who is it sent to? Who is able to open this scroll? Who's the recipient who not only has the authority to open it, but to enact with power what's in it? Who is able to do that? Who is this designed for, this king of history? Who is able and worthy to open this scroll? The son of David is worthy. Do you feel the world is broken? Do you? Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all?
Receive now the blessing. He who is blessed and the only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality and who dwells in unapproachable light, to him be honor and eternal dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Join us downstairs if you have a few moments for uh, potluck. God bless you all. Thank you for being here. Thanks, folks online.